We primarily work locally in Eastern Massachusetts. I'll talk just a bit at the end about some of our international work, but about three quarters of our work and our effort and resources are spent right here in Eastern Massachusetts, working with organisms, rare species like these. We do a lot of work with turtles. So up on the top left, that very charming fellow is a young female Blanding's turtle, species that we've worked with since 2003. Uh, on the center right is an eastern box turtle. We work with a couple of other rare turtle species here in eastern Massachusetts. We work with some rare amphibians, including the state's rarest salamander, that's the marbled salamander top center, and with the state's rarest frog species, eastern spadefoot toad, which we've been helping reintroduce at a population in Falmouth, and we're also hoping to reintroduce closer to the zoo at Assabet River National Wildlife Refuge. We work with some invertebrates, and we're starting a project now with one of the rarest insects in New England, the federally endangered American burying beetle. We'll do it, we're doing that in conjunction and under the guidance of Roger Williams Park Zoo. We work with some fish species, including this bridal shiner, and we're hoping to start working with a really rare species that lives right in Jamaica Plain, the three-spined stickleback. And we work with some plant species, rare wildflowers, that are particularly um, often important to native pollinators. So this species on the bottom left, the New England blazing star, is the species that we've, plant species that we've put the most time into locally. And on this New England blazing star is a great spangled fritillary, just showing the interrelationship. And then on the bottom right, these beautiful orange flowers are one of our rare native milkweeds. This is butterfly milkweed, which is also very important for, for butterflies, including monarchs. So to give you an idea of some of the work that we do, I'll start out using Blanding's turtles as an example, because we've spent the most time and effort working with these guys at several sites now, scattered throughout Eastern Massachusetts. Blanding's turtles are long-lived animals that occur throughout the northern tier of the United States, from Minnesota, um, Iowa, and Nebraska, east through New England, through southern New England. Massachusetts has by far the most Blanding's turtles in New England, and then there's scattered populations in Ontario and Nova Scotia. They are a rare animal throughout their range, and their populations have been declining in most places steadily for decades. I happen to live right near a population of Blanding's turtles, one of the regionally significant populations in Concord at Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. Some of these turtles have nested within 200 yards of my house, so for me, these guys live right here in my backyard, and hence my interest and our interest, again, in working with the animals that live around us. Unfortunately, at Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge in Concord, as at many other populations, the numbers of these animals have been crashing. In most cases, with most wildlife populations, we have no idea. We, we have no idea what past numbers were. We might be able to go out and estimate the number of turtles, we might be able to count the number of flowering stems of a rare wildflower or catch fish and estimate how many there may be in a section of stream or in a pond. But we have no idea in most cases how many there were 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. In the case of the Blanding's turtles at Great Meadows right near me, those turtles happen to have been studied by groups throughout the 1970s and 1980s. And so we do know that there were about 150 adult Blanding's turtles at Great Meadows in the 1970s. Now the numbers are down to about 50 adults. So a decline of 60% or so. And most of our anecdotal information suggests that Blanding's turtle populations throughout the United States and Canada have generally been decreasing by similar amounts and many of the populations have disappeared over that time. So what can we do about it? Rather than just observe, we go out, we catch Blanding's turtles, we radio track Blanding's turtles. We estimate the sizes of their populations. We find out how many girls and boys there are. We find out how many young there are. We assess the health of the turtles. And we track the mother turtles to their nest sites. And in fact, Blanding's turtles, like many of the rare turtles in Massachusetts, as we've learned, nest primarily where? In people's yards. Why? Because 
turtles like Blanding's turtles are seeking easy to dig in spots where the soil is loose and really warm and sunny. Perfect spot is somebody's patch of daylilies right next to their driveway, right? The asphalt on the driveway, catching all that sun during the summer period when the eggs are developing in the nest, warms up the nest, speeds up the development of the eggs, perfect for the turtles, a beautiful sight, right? On somebody's lawn. So what do we do? Over years and years working with different populations, we've developed relationships with people who live in these neighborhoods. We send them postcards before nesting season to let them know that rare turtles may be nesting in their neighborhoods. We track the turtles with radio transmitters and visually, and we find a turtle nesting in a yard like this. We knock on people's doors, we introduce ourselves, we give them a card or a brochure. In many cases, they already know about us. In many cases, they call us and tell us that the turtles are nesting in our yards. And as a, as a token of their contribution, of the homeowners contributing the willingness to allow these turtles to nest on their property and to work with us to allow us to protect the nests so that the eggs don't get eaten by predators like raccoons and skunks. We give each homeowner in these turtle nest households free passes to Zoo New England and New England Aquarium. Then we cover the nest to secure it from predators, which are much more common than they would have been hundreds of years ago now in suburban, the suburban landscape of Massachusetts. And we wait. We wait till the eggs hatch. In some cases, we dig the eggs up a little bit before they hatch, and we let the babies emerge indoors. And we take the babies, and we don't stop there. If we simply did this, if we simply protected the nest from predators, and also from humans inadvertently digging them up, we would be helping. We'd probably help produce about three or four times as many young Blanding's turtles as would hatch on their own if we did nothing. But those little baby turtles, like this individual, this is a one month old Blanding's turtle in this girl's hand, a newly hatched turtle, a Blanding's turtle about the size of a half dollar, has about a one in 100 chance of living to be an adult. And for Blanding's turtles, that's a long time. To go from this stage right here as a newly hatched turtle to an adult takes a female Blanding's turtle at least 16 years, usually 18 to 20 years. So we don't stop there. We take the babies out of the nests with permission and in cooperation with Mass Wildlife. We distribute the baby turtles, Blanding's turtles, wood turtles, we do this with snapping turtles in places like Boston now, and we hope to be, and with Eastern box turtles, we hope to be doing this with spotted turtles as well, and we distribute them to schools. This year, we have turtles in about, rare turtles in about 50 different schools, and we have the school children and the teachers raise those turtles for the entire school year, so for about nine months. This process, which we call head starting, helps protect the turtles, obviously, during this really vulnerable time of life. And even more importantly, because we keep the turtles warm during what would otherwise be their winter outdoors and we feed them as much as they want, they grow super fast. So if you look at this turtle and this seventh grade girl from one of the classes that's worked with us for more than 10 years in Sudbury, here is the same turtle, same girl wearing the same shirt nine months later the turtle now sports a very fashionable radio transmitter glued to its carapace. And this turtle is now about 20 times bigger, 20 times heavier than it was when it hatched out. That little baby turtle with a soft, flexible shell that just came out of its egg that weighed barely as much as a quarter would have been susceptible to predation by anything with a mouth. Chipmunks eat them, bullfrogs eat them, goldfish eat them, Domestic cats eat them, blue jays eat them, garter snakes eat them. This turtle now, a 200 gram turtle, 20 times heavier, does not have to worry about bullfrogs. It does not have to worry about blue jays. Does not have to worry about chipmunks. Does not have to worry about garter snakes. This turtle is much better able to survive on its own in the wild. And we know that because we have tracked more than 150 hatchling turtles after we've released them to see how well they do in the wild. We've tracked some of them for more than five years. 
And we estimate that by both protecting the nests and head starting these turtles for nine months, we give each turtle that comes through our program with the help of the school children and the teachers and we at Zoo New England and our conservation partners about a 40 fold increase in its odds of reaching adulthood. So rather than a one in 100 chance of reaching um, sexually mature adulthood, this turtle that's been head started has close to a one in two chance of reaching adulthood. And by doing this in this way, by having all of these children and teachers take part in this and recruiting lots of adult volunteers to help us with our work, we are informing people about these rare animals that live right in their towns and in their communities and helping them become informed and passionate and conscientious stewards. Emily Wilder runs our programs and she now administers a program in which we raise rare wild animals in about 60 K through 12 schools in Eastern Massachusetts every year. More than 5,000 students a year take part in classroom presentations, many of them done by Kara McElroy, shown here, who works with us. And we take most of those children out on field trips. And we do the same thing, not only for turtles, but with many of the rare species that we work with. This beautiful small animal is a marbled salamander. And right now, if you were to go to Stone Zoo, to the Animal Discovery Center, which unfortunately with COVID remains closed, but hopefully next year you can go and see these guys. We raise them at Stone Zoo and we raise them at four high schools. We are helping return this rare salamander in Massachusetts to the Middlesex Fells. This species was once present throughout Northeastern Massachusetts, has disappeared in the wake of tremendous habitat changes that happened over centuries in Northeastern Massachusetts. They were last seen in Middlesex Fells in the 1930s, but since that time, the fells have been protected. Forests have regrown there. The vernal pools that these animals depend to breed upon have recovered and are numerous. And so we have the opportunity to reintroduce this rare species to the Middlesex Fells, just north of Boston and right next to the Stone Zoo. And we do this through first going out to sites in Western Massachusetts and collecting marbled salamander larvae. Here I am with my dog Squiggles, my intrepid field assistant, catching marbled salamanders in December. The salamanders are actually laid, their eggs are laid in late autumn and they usually don't hatch around here until late November or December. We catch these small larvae like the one in the picture with these bushy wild external gills we raise them in the Stone Zoo or in high schools like the Stoneham and Medford high schools until they metamorphose into small salamanders. We get them to bulk up like we do with the turtles. So they're more likely, more fit and likely to survive. And we release them in suitable locations in the fells. And now we're tracking vernal pools in the fells to find out how the salamanders are doing. We do similar programs with Eastern box turtles and wood turtles, and we try all kinds of innovative techniques. Right now, Chris Bartos, assistant curator of hooves and horns at Franklin Park Zoo, who is also an expert at training scent dogs, is helping us work with this beautiful dog, Coda. Here's Coda as a puppy. Coda is now about two years old and has been in training to help us find box turtles and wood turtles in the wild. Because to help protect these animals, we need to be able to find them to assess their populations. We humans are terrible at finding animals like box turtles and wood turtles which spend the summer months in dense brush, but a dog like Coda can beat us anytime. So we're really looking forward to Coda's help. And we do, we work with the landowners who have rare species habitat to help them manage the habitat better for rare species. This might look like a conservation nightmare, but it's actually we, we, it's actually a conservation opportunity that we help design that will help rare box turtles and rare birds, the Eastern Whippoorwill in Dunstable, Massachusetts. We work at a site there with the town of Dunstable, local land trust and with the state. And we observe by radio tracking box turtles over years there, 
that this really important box turtle population that lives in this area happens to spend almost all of their time on private property where they're subject to all kinds of dangers, including the recent construction of a 40 acre solar farm. And the turtles mostly avoid the conservation land that's owned by the town and the state right nearby. Why? By tracking the turtles and observing their behavior and looking at their habitat preferences, talking to other experts about the species, reading the literature, we, we deduced that the turtles avoid the conservation areas primarily because there are no big clearings. Box turtles love to nest in open sunny clearings in the woods and they spend a lot of their time foraging in scrubby brushy areas of early second growth, the kind of stuff that grows within five years or 10 years of an area being, um, being logged or deforested by natural means. So the town of Dunstable was already logging in this property to help generate money for future conservation work, but they were doing it in a way that would not have created any clearings. We worked with them to design a three acre clearing and within that three acre clearing, a one acre area where the loggers were happy to use their heavy equipment to scrape away the topsoil so that we could create a nice big sand pit that is suitable for box turtles, great site for whippoorwills, and also a wonderful site for us to plant some of the rare wildflowers that we work with. So thinking of those wildflowers, our idea here is simple. We look around us, even in this really urbanized part of the world, and we say there are lots of rare and wonderful plant and animal species that live all around us. Some of them struggling to maintain their populations. Some of these populations having disappeared in recent decades. And we say, where are there opportunities for us to help restore populations? Where are there opportunities for us to help reintroduce populations that once occurred. We're now working with this beautiful plant, the New England Blazing Star, which once occurred throughout Metro West Boston. There were populations in Cambridge that were recorded. There were populations in Framingham. There were populations in Newton and Concord. All the towns around here, most of the towns within 128 and 495. And yet the species is essentially entirely gone from Northeastern Massachusetts. And it's a really important species for many insects. You can just make out this flower bug over here that's living on the blazing star stem. And of course, this is a monarch butterfly. Many of you know that monarch butterflies need milkweeds for their caterpillars, but the adult monarch butterflies need flowers that produce a lot of nectar, especially in August and September when they're fueling up for their long flight down to Mexico. And New England blazing stars flower at exactly the right time and they produce lots of nectar, exactly what monarch butterflies need. So we are planting New England blazing stars, reintroducing them currently to four different sites. We hope to add a couple of new sites and we even have New England blazing stars now growing in the Fenway Victory Gardens in a new demonstration pollinator garden that that group um, has recently created. And we just wanted to show you also, here's another example of an opportunity that we take advantage of. And again, here right near my home, here's me with my other dog, this is Stella. This is just about 300 yards from my house. This is a field that is owned by the town of Concord and has been leased for many years to farmers um, to uh, grow crops. And about 25 years ago, the lease was transferred from one farmer to another and the new farmers at Hutchins Farm um, are organic farmers really interested in stewardship of their land. They readily agreed to a suggestion that I made at the time and, the, and with the cooperation of the town to put five acres of this 20 acre field into specific protection for Blanding's turtles because we're right at, near the Blanding's turtle population for Blanding's turtles to nest in. So for many years, the farmers managed this five acres by tilling it in the spring before the turtles nested and planting a cover crop of non-native buckwheat. And then over the summer, it would grow all of this kind of weedy ragweed and horseweed. And then when we told the farmers that the turtles had finished hatching, usually in October, 
they would till it again and plant a winter cover crop of annual rye. And this worked okay, it would provide nesting habitat for the turtles, but the farmers didn't like it because they had to spend all of this time and effort tilling the field twice during the course of the year, putting down seed, which would just get plowed in. The field was just a weedy mess, providing little habitat value to anything but the few turtles that nested in it. So we thought there's got to be a better way. We sat down with the farmers and with the town and we said, okay, what we can do here is we can plant native, some of them rare in New England, wildflowers and grass species that are perennials. They'll hold the soil better. The farmers no longer will have to plow this area. They won't have to expend any more time and money on seed. And so in 2016, we recruited some volunteers like these two folks here. We hand seeded a lot of the field. The farmers helped us seed some of the area by machinery. And we also hand grew many of the plants that we put out there. And here now, this was actually taken in 2019, last year. The field is five acres of stunning native wildflowers that, pr that provide just an incomparable benefit to all kinds of native pollinators, to birds, mammals, many species that use it. Just as an example, one of the species that we did not plant that came on its own, right, in the sort of build it and they will come model is a rare native plant that used to occur from historical journals right near this site called Rattlebox, Downy Rattlebox, a plant that is almost extinct in Massachusetts now, but it's come back. I don't have any of the Rattlebox in the picture, but the Rattlebox has come back and spread over the site on its own. And this little moth and in the inset on the right, this beautiful little moth is called the ornate Bella moth. It's a species that's completely dependent on Rattlebox. As Rattlebox had disappeared from Massachusetts, so had the moth. We made the field, we planted it with native wildflowers, the Rattlebox came back, and so did the moth. So most of our work is done locally here in Eastern Massachusetts, but our collections of animals at Franklin Park, Stu or Franklin Park Zoo and Stone Zoo are primarily of animals from elsewhere. And so we have a really robust and growing international conservation footprint as well. And we take the same small step-by-step -step grassroots, work with the local people, figure out what they need, figure out how we can help them be better conservation stewards approach to these projects. We have a new formula for supporting these projects. We work through a zoo-wide conservation committee that decides upon the projects. We support each of these projects that we choose as a conservation partnership for at least three years. In, and then if it's working out, we can renew those three-year commitments as long as we care to. The, most, the longest going of these projects, the second one um, from the left on the top, this beautiful frog is one of the harlequin toads from Panama and Dr. Eric Bachman who will be talking at another Zootopia um, event at four o'clock, has been working on this project now for something like 18 years, you know, 12 years, about 12 years, in Panama with uh, several other zoos and with a number of different organizations in Panama. And we have been contributing not only money to this project, but Eric has gone many times to Panama. Years ago, I went with him once and we've been sending conservation department and facilities people to help with a captive breeding facility that they maintain now in Panama. And in, in some of the species, including the pa beautiful Panamanian golden frog, which is extinct in the wild, is now maintained only in captive breeding facilities, like the one that we support in Panama. In addition to the frogs, we work with cross river gorillas, the rarest gorilla subspecies, the subspecies of Western lowland gorillas in Nigeria, where we help support rangers at a national park, Afi Mountain National Park, that has a critical population of Cross River gorillas. We contribute to the efforts of the Snow Leopard Trust to protect snow leopards um, in Mongolia through a really, invade, really inventive program that they do to um, engender the support of local villagers to become stewards of these guys. We work in Costa Rica 
with a group that helps protect Baird's tapirs, these beautiful large animals of the, of the Central American rainforests. And the group that we work with, the Baird's Tapir Survival Alliance, also works extensively in schools in Costa Rica. We work with the rarest turtle in the Americas in Belize. We support a giraffe reintroduction program in, in Uganda, and we'll be supporting the conservation of one of the rarest and most unique mammal species in the world, the Cuban selenodon in a remote part of Northwestern Cuba. Our philosophy here at Zoo New England is pretty well expressed by this quote from my favorite conservation author and conservation philosopher of our times, Emma Maris. And she talks about the kind of work that we're able to do. And she writes, we can't go back. We can't have this pristine wilderness that we've always dreamed. And this sounds like a huge tragedy. It sounds like we've lost the battle. But actually, Emma Maris writes, what I've realized is that it can be exciting and invigorating to give up on pristine wilderness as your goal. Because then you can have all kinds of other goals and you can go out there and create more nature everywhere, including right here in Boston and in Eastern Massachusetts. I wanna thank you all for being here and I will take your questions in a moment. I also want to take a moment to thank our generous Zootopia sponsors who are helping fund this, in, this event.